Oh, so good evening, everybody. Warm welcome to today's uh, uh, Rising Smart Learning Program, and uh, and this is uh, uh, today's the second uh, uh, virtual theme or board of uh, this calendar year. The first one we had was on the theme of uh, metastatic renal uh, cancer and locally advanced renal cancer. Um, and today we have uh, uh, the theme on prostate cancer, and uh, we have none other than the renowned faculty who is professor of Department of Urology at uh, Ames Kochi, Dr. Jinil, uh, who will be convener of this session. Uh, he will be joined by uh, the urologist Dr. Bindu, uh, radiation oncologist Dr. Haridas, and uh, medical oncologist Dr. Nikhil Haridas, and uh, uh, we'll have. Uh, a um, the presentation from Dr. Dr. Vishnu Prasad. Uh, with this, I hand over to Dr. Jinil first to tell us how we'll be conducting the session, and then probably uh, to start the session. Over to you, Dr. Jinil. Uh, thank you, Arun. Thanks for this opportunity. I thank uh, USI for giving us uh, uh, this uh, great opportunity to interact with postgraduates because we are learning more from them than anybody else. Because when we are teaching or when you are conducting, we are actually learning. Um, the thing is about tumor board, whoever who ha had never attended a tumor board, is like a decision-making board meeting, like any other uh, board meeting, like when there is a confusing case or when there is interaction is required. This is the forum in which we find a solution for our uh, confusions in diagnosis, discuss about the advances and come out to the, the uh, the final decision. So here, usually we conduct uh, our tumor board every week, but in high volume center, it may be every day or so. But thing is, uh, we conduct, uh, we compile all the cases in every week and important cases. If it's a straightforward cases, sometimes we don't uh, 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 discuss, but almost every case we discuss in the tumor board and come out with a decision to how to proceed. It is very important in uh, when there's a uh, multi-departmental or uh, a decision is re required. So with this introduction, I'll introduce, uh, uh, already uh, I don't have introduced. Uh, this is actually like our regular tumor board in our uh, department where we uh, present the cases. Dr. Vishnu Prasad, uh, our urology fellow, he has completed MCH urology from Satsajan joined us and he'll be in uh, uh, he'll be uh, presenting the cases and uh, usually in tumor board we come out with the decision but uh, in this tumor board for uh, the benefit of the first graduate few of the points we discuss in depth and uh, with the evidence behind uh, so this is our plan so uh, we'll be uh, uh, vishnu will be present the cases and rest of us will be discussing the cases Power to you, Vishnu. You can present, uh, start presenting the first case. Any more point, any class uh, clarification is uh, uh, dis uh, uh, required from any of the uh, 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 any of the delegates. Uh, otherwise, we will proceed with the case discussion. Shall we proceed with case discussion? Yeah, Jinil, okay. Uh, fine. Uh, so, the again, what Jinil has uh, uh, spoken to you, if you have any doubt, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question by raising the hand, or you can put your questions in the chat box, which Dr. Jiri will be taking uh, during the time of moderation and traction with the other faculty. Over to you, Jiri. Thank you, thank you, Arun. Uh, Vishnu, you can start presenting the cases. Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, well audible. Okay, I'll just uh, share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so good evening. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Ginil sir and the USI for giving me this opportunity. So today I'll directly go ahead. Uh, I think already introduction has been made. So I will not repeat the same. We have mainly three cases to be discussed today. That is one is a locally advanced CA prostate. One is an oligometastatic CA prostate and one is metastatic CRPC. So in these cases, we'll be dealing with how to adequately diagnose and manage such patients in various scenarios to see what are the second and third line therapies and how to sequence them, and also talk a little bit about the recent advances. So let's go straight ahead with the first case. 
we have a 75 year old male patient with an ecog status of 1 he is a known case of hyper he has hypertension and diabetes he came to us with obstructive bloods since 2 months and also painless terminal hematuria since 1 month his ips score was 25 a rectal ex examination revealed a hard nodule on the right side but the rectal mucosa was free and the size was grade 1 he had no significant past history no family history of cancer his PSA was 8.61. So we did an MRI pelvis for this patient, which showed a T2 lesion in the right peripheral zone, as well as the transitional zone, which was seen to extend outside of the prostate. I'll just read out the final uh, MRI pelvis report. So there was a T2 lesion seen at the midline at the apex and mid gland in both peripheral zones and adjacent transitional zones, a Pyrads 5 lesion. There was capsular breach seen with loss of fat planes with anterior wall of rectum and obliteration of rectoprostatic angles on both sides, with the right side being more involved than the left side. There was another nodule seen at the transitional zone in the mid gland on the left side. And also, the left seminal vesicle shows a T2 dark signal. On the MRI, there was an enlarged external iliac node measuring approximately 1.6 centimeters. So, in this patient, we went ahead and did a trust guided biopsy which showed an asina adenocarcinoma, a Gleason score of 4 plus 5 with a grade group of 5. There was perineural invasion seen in one core with no lymphovascular invasion. Further, further metastatic workup in this patient, we did a PSMA PET, C, PET scan, which showed a PSMA avid lesion in the prostate, as well as a PSMA avid lesion in the external iliac lymph node. Again, the PET scan showed there was a PSMA avid lesion with capsular breach and loss of fat planes with anterior wall of rectum, as mentioned by the MRI pelvis. There was also uptake in the left external iliac node, as mentioned. So a diagnosis of locally advanced CA prostate, that is locally advanced to the rectum with a positive lymph node was made, a clinically T4A, N1, M0. So we will talk further about how to manage this case. So the first question I would like to ask uh, Bindu ma'am about some basics about CA prostate and Gleason scoring. Uh, so ma'am, how would you determine the Gleason score in a CA prostate in a biopsy and also in the final histopathology? And could you tell us more about prognostic grade groups? Okay. <clears throat> Can you go to the next slide, please, Dr. Vishnu? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is the picture of the case that was discussed by Dr. Vishnu. Uh, wherein we have given a, uh, um, Gleason, uh, I mean, a report of uh, prostatic SNR adenocarcinoma with a Gleason score of 4 plus 5 and a prognostic group grade of 5. <clears throat> um, as you can see in the first picture that is on the left-hand side, the, uh, here the tumor cells are forming more of fused glands or rather a cribriform pattern, whereas on the right-hand side, it is more in solid sheets. Over to the next slide, Dr. Vishnu. Uh, before uh, getting into, uh, yeah, I'll uh, briefly touch upon the Gleason's grading and scoring. As you all know, uh, this is one of the grading and scoring system in pathology where we do not look into the uh, cytological atypia, the mitosis or uh, um, uh, things like that. In all other tumors in pathology, we look into these parameters for grading, whereas in uh, uh, in prostate, the Gleason's uh, uh, system of grading, we look at the pattern that the tumor is depicting, whether it is forming uh, glands, and if so, whether the glands are lying, um, lying singly, discrete, or whether there is a fusion, whether th there is a formation of cribriform pattern, is it forming solid? So, um, as you can see in the picture, the left-hand side picture is the one which was uh, like uh, initially formulated by uh, Dr. Gleason. And this has uh, uh, undergone several revisions over time. And as you can see, uh, like uh, uh, in uh, pattern one, in grade one and two, you see discrete glands, but in case of grade one, they form a well-circumscribed uh, uh, well circumscribed lesion, whereas in grade two, they are discrete glands. That's the second picture on the right side. Um, discrete glands, but there will be spaces in between, and it will it will not have a regular uh, outline. Whereas in case of three, you you have to see discrete. The latest update is that only those uh, tumors which form discrete glandular formation can be considered as pattern three. 
uh, all cribriform cribriform uh, in the sense these are sheets of tumor cells which uh, in uh, amidst which you see glandular lumen formation and all cribriform pattern um, irrespective of whether they are regular or irregular round or whatever is now shifted from uh, uh, grade 3 to grade 4 so all cribriforms come under grade 4 and uh, in case of uh, and uh, in addition to the cribriform pattern you would also see polyform glands um, and, or glomeruloid formations all these are patterns that are described in pattern 4 whereas in 5 which is the worst uh, group uh, i mean grade you see more of solid sheets of cells or you see glandular formations but within the glandular nest you would see comedo necrosis you would also see um, cells in uh, cords or singly infiltrating into the stroma. So this is in nutshell about the score, grading and scoring. Can you please go to the next slide, Dr. Vishnu? Okay. So now how do you, um, uh, I mean, how do you score a, a prostatic cancer? The, the, the most predominant pattern is considered as the first, uh, first pattern. Suppose uh, it is forming only discrete glands. Um, the majority of the tumor that is pattern three and that forms a primary pattern and if at all the tumor is depicting a secondary pattern that is called as the secondary pattern and you combine both and give a score out of 10. So if it is three and a secondary pattern of four it is scored as three plus four equals seven on ten. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, situations where and sometimes you can also see a tertiary pattern and uh, the the consensus about whether you should yeah, whether or not to include the tertiary pattern depends on whether the tertiary pattern is of a higher grade or a lower grade as you can see in this picture um, you are seeing uh, 95 percentage of the tumor is comprising of pattern three and there is a five percentage which is a pattern four so the um, the, uh, the score is three plus four which uh, is seven on ten next slide please okay now here is an example wherein you are seeing three patterns. Uh, predominant is three with a secondary pattern of four, but you have a, a tertiary pattern of five, which is comprising of 20 percentage. But since five is a worse pattern, you have to take that as a secondary pattern and give the final report as three plus five equals eight. Next slide, please. And um, if it's, it's the same scenario here, the percentage of the uh, the worst pattern that is pattern five here is only two percentage this is in case of needle biopsies whereas this rule this rule doesn't uh, apply if the specimen is a radical prostatectomy specimen if it is a needle core no matter what the percentage of the worst pattern is you have to take it as the secondary pattern because it is that which is going to decide or probably it is there is more of that pattern in when you get the final specimen so that is, um, but there is, uh, uh, this was the consensus that was reached by the 2014 update of ISUP, but later on in the year 2019 and later, there were, uh, in addition to the ISUP, one more group has come up, that is the GUPS, that is Genital Urinary Pathologist, Pathologist Society, where there, uh, there is a slight disagreement uh, about this issue. Next slide, please, Dr. Vishnu. Uh, okay, now uh, again, the 2014 ISUP consensus has come up with a new group grade, uh, prognostic group grading system, wherein the tumors are classified into five grades, grade one to five, uh, as opposed to the uh, Gleason scoring, which was uh, calculated on 10. Um, and uh, this was based on a multi-institution study, wherein they uh, studied about, uh, about 20,000 radical prostatectomies, 16 a thousand odd needle biopsy specimens and uh, over 5,000 other biops, uh, biopsy specimens followed following radiation therapy. And there was about 90% consensus. And uh, uh, next slide, Dr. Vishnu, according to this new system, the tumor gets uh, graded into uh, one to five, wherein grade, group grade one is anything, any tumor which is three plus three equals six. And grade group, uh, grade group Two is three plus four equals seven because pattern four, the percentage of pattern four is very important and uh, prognostically. So whatever uh, amount of pattern four you see in the biopsy has to be reported. And in case of uh, group grade three, it is four plus three. There the pattern four will be predominating. Next slide. 
grade uh, gra grade group 4 is anything which uh, uh, which uh, gives a total of 8 um, that is it could be 4 plus 4 or 3 plus 5 or a 5 plus 3 and group grade 5 is anything uh, uh, which gives uh, a total of 9 and 10 it's it could be either 4 plus 5 or 5 plus 4 or a 5 plus 5 so this is about the prognostic group grading is that okay dr vishnu do you uh, do you need anything more no i think that's a very good uh, explanation ma'am okay thank you uh, so since you got a basic idea about the uh, pathological gleason scoring uh, let's discuss the management in this case so this is a was a locally advanced ca prostate i would like to ask a uh, ginel sir would you offer surgery up front in this patient what are the points that would should be considered for and against surgery and is there a role of new adjuvant hormone therapy in this patient uh vishnu can you just uh, go back to the previous uh, mri slide if possible so important factors in this patient is uh, uh, one is age of the patient clinically the age of the patient performance status then the stage of the disease grade of the disease everything has to be calculated before we decide on to what should be the uh, uh, treatment so important factors here are one he is symptomatic and he is 75 so he should get a uh, uh, a clinical benefit uh, symptomatic benefit second he is uh, but mri wise he is having a uh, he is having gleason uh, 4 plus 5 4 plus that 5. is uh, the highest uh, uh, risk group and mri wise it is extra prostatic and we can see that uh, in one of the uh, 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 mri uh, mri uh, uh, risk, uh, they have uh, report as having a rectal infiltration is it yes sir so rectal infiltration these are the main points so i don't want this 75 year old uh, 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 patient to have a stoma or something because the quality of life is very important so uh, something is required for uh, uh, reducing the uh, a cytoreduction and a definite treatment so whether there is adequate evidence for hormone treatment followed by radiation there are some recent evidence but it is not uh, 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 optimal for a patient who is 75 uh, i feel that uh, radiation plus uh, a hormone a neurogen hormone plus radiation may be a better option for this patient since he is 75 he, are, he is a uh, he is uh, having a rectal infiltration and he is having a lip node also so considering these factors uh, hormone plus uh, rp may be a uh, option but there are some patient who insist on surgery in those patient i may go for a neurogen hormone plus uh, a rp in a, in a young patient who is uh, having a he is ready for a multimodal treatment probably a uh, uh, hormone even with uh, neurogen a uh, you know, hormone with abiraterol followed by surgery and uh, uh, if required a rp in follow up are all tried but for this patient i would say i'll go for a hormone plus uh, rp which is the uh, most uh, advised option at this scenario okay sir so there is one study which has looked at intense uh, neoadjuvant hormone therapy for high risk localized prostate cancer who has undergone surgery later on so they have randomized to they have added apalutamide abiraterone prednisolone and diluprolide and they have compared it to the other group and they have seen uh, approximately 10% complete pathological response and uh, bcr rate of around 59% so there is some some role of neoadjuvant uh, hormone therapy in high risk and locally advanced cases so since we have we have erring towards uh, radiation i would like to ask uh, dr haridas sir what would be the initial counseling at first visit when the patient comes and if planning for radiation plus hormone <clears throat> what kind of radiation will you be offering what are logistic involved and if offering hormone therapy how long would you prefer to give hormone therapy uh from the counseling point of view i think uh, before counseling we would generally assess the patient like dr ganel was mentioning we would assess the performance status of the patient the age the comorbidities uh expected survival there are a lot of uh, indices which help us uh, uh, predict uh, what is a 5 year or 10 year survival of such a patient 
uh, based on its comorbidities, general condition, and other uh, uh, issues. Uh, so that would be the first uh, that would help us decide how radically or how aggressively to go ahead with our uh, radical infant uh, treatment. So, uh, uh, so it, the age is just a number, and I think the patient needs to be taken into consideration before we take a decision on an uh, aggressive line of treatment, and that uh, what the uh, impact of that such a treatment is going to be on his quality of life. So, second, I think uh, in this patient, as you had mentioned, the patient also has severe obstructive symptoms. Uh, which is also a consideration that needs to be taken and patient needs to be the patient's main concern is his obstructive symptoms right patient might not be much worried at this stage about his uh, prostate cancer the uh, possibility of metastasis and all that but probably for the patient the more what impacts his quality of life is going to be the obstructive urinary symptoms so i think that needs to be taken into consideration to uh, know the baseline what is the uh, obstructive uh, baseline symptoms and how we can address that um, then i I think we need to discuss, like uh, Dr. Ginnell was uh, explaining, the different treatment options, the impact it will have. And as from this, uh, from what you have mentioned, this is a very locally advanced uh, carcinoma prostate, uh, possibly T4 disease with nodal metastasis, uh, Gleason grade, uh, grade uh, 9, uh, group of 5. Uh, so it is a reasonably very aggressive disease. And at this age, I think we, a multimodality treatment may not be an ideal option. And uh, hormone treatment plus radiation treatment would be the or treatment of choice. Now, when you counsel, I think you have to explain to the patient uh, because patient needs to be, uh, so for this patient, we would, uh, when we start hormone treatment, we would start with um, probably seeing in view of his uh, obstructive symptoms, something that might relieve his obstructive symptoms uh, much more faster. Maybe we would consider in the initial phases an LRH, LHRH antagonist, uh, that may be an option considering, and then we would reassess him periodically to assess what is the severity of it. He's not in acute unit retention, right? No, no, he's not in retention. So, so the patient is, so I think we can closely monitor him for the response to the, uh, how his urinary obstructive symptoms. If his uh, urinary obstructive symptoms are predominantly due to the disease related, I think he, with the first few injections or uh, first few months of hormone treatment itself, he would have a dramatic improvement in his obstructive symptoms. In case he doesn't have, then we need to think about whether there is a need for a TURP before uh, embarking on a radiation treatment uh, uh, before we embark on radiation treatment. So I think we would give him time to reassess the urinary symptoms and then take a decision on how to overcome the urinary obstruction, obstructive symptoms. Uh, so hormone treatment usually we uh, give for a total period of around two to three years for a uh, non-metastatic but locally advanced uh, disease like this. Uh, the duration, there are a lot of studies uh, doing uh, between one to two years, three years, 2.5 years. But I think the general consensus is at least a minimum of two years to a maximum of three years. And we would start the radiation treatment if his urinary symptoms are all getting better and there is no actual uh, significant uh, severe obstructive uh, urinary symptoms persisting. We would proceed to radiation treatment by around fourth or sixth month of between four to six months of uh, uh, starting ADT. In his case, especially, there is always a debate between whether neoadjuvant bar concomitant ADT is better than the adjuvant ADT. Uh, there is no real head-on comparison showing one is better than the other. There are different philosoph uh, th philosophical thoughts, but I think uh, as a routine practice, everybody is comfortable with the neoadjuvant and uh, concomitant ADT because one, it uh, helps in these kind of scenarios to assess the urinary obstructive symptoms too. Like you mentioned, there are a lot of logistics when you need to plan radiation treatment, which generally might last for one to one and a half months. So it gives the patient also some time to arrange the finances as well as the logistics to be able to be present for a radiation therapy treatment. Uh, radiation treatment technique point of view, uh, what is recommended is an IMRT or an IGRT technique. What is IMRT is intensity modulated radiation therapy uh, with daily image guidance. So because uh, radiation uh, doses ranging from 74 to 80 gray is what is recommended for a prostate uh, disease for adequate local control. Uh, those escalation studies are also there, which are showing that the higher the dose you go, there is better local control. So to make sure that you're not ex uh, uh, inducing unwanted toxicities or unacceptable toxicities, uh, uh, intensity modulated radiation treatment with a daily image guidance, which we refer to as image guided radiation therapy, is essential and uh, would be the best uh, option for such a uh, patient with prostate, locally advanced prostate cancer. So various dose schedules are there, but I'm, I think that might confuse the uh, students, but I think an equivalent dose of 74 to 80 gray at least is required, is recommended uh, for adequate local control. 
then we need to also counsel the patient regarding the expected toxicities as well as uh, like cystitis, proctitis, enteritis, and stricture, which with modern radiation techniques are only up to 5% at the max. Grade 2, grade 3, grade 4 toxicities don't exceed uh, 2 to 3 percentage in the current uh, modern radiation therapy techniques. Okay, I think uh, is that. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, that was a great insight into Krishna, the. I think uh, radiation. we may have to we read up a little because. On. Yes, sir. Yeah. We are running out of time. Uh, just the uh, role of systemic therapy in such a scenario, mm -hmm. Nikhil, sir, is a role of chemotherapy or abiratron and enzalutamide in this patient of locally advanced CA prostate. Yeah, regarding chemotherapy, there is a, I have a black and white answer that there is no role for chemotherapy. And even enzalutamide in this current non metastatic locally advanced disease, there is no role. Abritron, we have the Stampede trial, which had uh, ADT in one arm plus radiation, followed by ADT plus Abritron plus or minus enzalutamide plus radiation in the other arm. In fact, there was an overall survival benefit of 86% in the Abritron arm compared to ADT alone which was uh, around 77%. So with this and adding a venzalotomide added toxicity with no uh, you know, difference in outcome. So there is a role for abritron in a T3, T4 advanced, locally advanced disease, along with maybe a Gleason of 8 to 10 and maybe a, a, you know, a PSA of greater than 40 and also uh, in a N1 disease. So abritron is the only drug which can be used in this current locally advanced setting. And usually it is also, you know, two to three years may okay. be the recommended treatment. <laughs> okay, sir. So just a quick uh, recap of the one guidelines say in locally uh, advanced CA prostate. So just it mentions that offer RP in only selected patients. Uh, radiotherapy is a good option. ADT should be given at least two to three years as uh, Harida sir had mentioned. And abritron uh, as we discussed. Uh, Vishnu, one yeah. point, the selected uh, needs a highlight. Selected, I will say, is the patient who we can reasonably expect the complete yes. clearance of the tumor by a surgery. That is a selector. Like it is a infiltrating the sphincter, we may not go for a surgery. If it is yes. uh, rectal also, if it is a minimal, we can have a clearance. Then only we, otherwise, if you are planning to leave behind a disease, never go for a RP in uh, 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 that kind of patients. It is better to go for a hormone plus RP. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just a take home message so, from uh, oh, okay, yes, sir, continuous please. So, abiratron is for uh, two years, is it? Uh, that was the question that was asked by uh, uh, okay. asked by Vineet. I, I uh, think Dr. Combined. Jinil, Dr. Jinil, yes, uh, when he finishes this case, you can take all the questions related to this and answer it. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. So, just a take home message from the locally advanced CA prostate. Uh, there are mainly three options, surgery, radiotherapy, and mainly abritron along with RT. Radical prostate, sir, has already mentioned which selected ca cases we have to uh, do surgery. Radiotherapy, ideal option. Abritron is latest evidence that can be added to RT and ADT in certain cases. So treatment should be individualized, taking into consideration patient factors, as well as comorbidities, fitness, and performance status. So we'll move on to the second case. So second case, we have a younger patient, 57-year-old male patient who is in a good ECOG status. He has no comorbidities. On a routine health checkup, he had a PSA elevation of 50. Vishnu, one yes. minute. Vishnu, Vishnu yeah. uh, if you yes. can uh, uh, let Janil finish this case by taking the question related to this okay. case. Okay. Janil, uh, 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 would you like to open the chat box and answer all the questions? Yeah, for I, uh, I don't know. We have answered the question almost everything. Okay, fine then, fine then. So, so I think one question, question that was box. asked is uh, the life expectancy. I think Dr. Ginless mentioned there are certain um, calculators. Uh, one of them is the Carlston MOPT index. There are a lot of uh, different, uh, again, they, those are all fine-tuned to the Western population and uh, based on their uh, survival uh, expectation. So I, I'm not sure how much we can extrapolate that to our Indian scenario. But I think uh, those are just uh, some standard calculators and charts that are available based on which you can at least uh, reasonably predict how long a patient will survive. Okay. Probably we can okay. proceed with the next case. Okay. So second case is a 57-year-old uh, male patient, PSA 53, which was instantly detected on routine health checkup. Rectal examination showed a hard right lobe of prostate. 
He has no family history of prostate cancer. He underwent a directly a trust guided biopsy, which showed a which showed an uh, Asner adenocarcinoma, a Gleason four plus three seven with a grade group of three, which no lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion. Now, metastatic workup, uh, we did a PET, PSMA PET CT, which showed a PSMA avid prostatic lesion, and also PSMA avid iliac bone lesions. So there were bone lesions actually in the right iliac. as well as in the left iliac bone and also in the sacrum so basically he has three three lesions psma with lesions in uh, three areas of the bone he also has multiple lymph nodes that is bilateral external iliac right internal iliac and common iliac nodes as a metastatic disease so he was diagnosed <clears throat> as a case of oligometastatic ca prostate that is t3a n1 and m1b So, what do we do? How do we manage this case? I would like to ask Genel sir, what comprises an oligometastatic disease, and what are the treatment options in this case? Is surgery an option? If so, what are the benefits and risks? Um, regarding oligometastatic disease, this is the new concept that has evolved because all the metas uh, prostate is a disease that has got a prolonged life, and all metastases cannot be put together. Oligometastasis has got a reasonable a prolonged life and so they have to be a bit more aggressively treated that is the concept because of which the standard uh, has changed uh, so uh, what is the benefit we are going to have in the oligometastasis mainly is the progression free life and progression free life also gives a better life so what defines oligometastasis uh, mainly there is based on two trials mainly in uh, uh, ca prostate one is the uh, uh, chartered where the high volume low volume disease were discussed as more than five metastases uh, uh chartered is uh, five or more or uh, uh, and uh, if there is visceral it is uh, a high volume disease and latitude it was mainly three or more so uh, these were the uh, cut off which was used so based on that uh, uh, it was uh, uh, divided into oligo or uh, high volume and recently there was a consensus uh, with uh, a rtog consensus was there in which the number of metastases is uh, taken as one more sentence is added where it is treatable so uh, less than 5 and treatable was considered as the cut off for oligo metastases in majority of the Uh, uh metastasis disease that was not site specific that was a general consensus in rtog uh, uh consensus panel so these are the different criteria for so we can say if we say uh 3 and 5 are taken as two cutoffs but most important thing is whether it is a treatable metastasis so another thing is uh, uh, majority of the trials we have uh, Uh, what we have studied is the treatment of the prostate local disease whether it pro, uh, it uh, it uh, prolongs the survival so in that we have got a stampede trial uh, based on that we can see that treatment of the local disease is uh, beneficial whether surgery is an option the more evidence is for radiation surgery there are some uh, uh, high volume center Uh, data which shows that surgery is beneficial, but more evidence is for radiation in oligometastasis disease, especially in long uh, young patient with uh, symptoms, limited metastasis. We can have a treatment of the prostate. Otherwise, majority of the older patients we will prefer to have a radiation rather than surgery. Any comment uh, about that, Hazar? yeah i think uh, like dr ginel said there is a lot of ambiguity on uh, what is an oligometastatic disease because it's a new concept and it's uh, still being refined through multiple discussions again like dr ginel said different sites have different uh, definitions look like for prostate we have a specific definition from the few trials charter trial the horard trial the uh, insta the stampede has followed the charter trial itself the latitude trial so a lot of uh, different definitions are there Uh, from a general uh, uh, sub uh, subset, uh, non-specific uh, way, for all other malignancies together, we have a consensus that up to uh, five uh, lesions is acceptable as an oligometastatic uh, disease. 
so there is uh, still some ambiguity but again from a prostate disease point of view uh, what uh, has been um, uh, the focus has been towards the primary disease where uh, whether there is a requirement for a treatment to the prostate primary prostatic disease in a metastatic uh, situation and there i think rt radiation therapy would generally be preferred due to a lot of advantages one it is uh, there is always there there are a lot of uh, trials that have now uh, with reasonable follow up especially the stampy data the horads data and there is a meta analysis of all these uh, different studies uh, which has shown that there is definitely an uh, benefit with regard to uh, survival as well uh, when you take into consideration the low volume metastatic disease in general uh, an, an unselected group of metastatic disease radiation does not add a survival benefit but if you take the low volume metastatic disease alone based on these criteria that have been mentioned in the chartered and the latitude uh, or the latitude uh, criteria there is a benefit with regard to survival so there is definitely proven effectiveness uh, toxicity is also not much because the dose uh, is not as high as we would give in the radical intent because there is always al already an intensified systemic treatment also going ahead so the toxicity profile is less and there is also a potential uh, concept of immune modulatory effects that will happen when radiation is combined with uh, systemic treatment uh, like uh, hormone treatment or the uh, abiratron or uh, uh, cytotoxic drugs or even in the future when immunotherapy comes into play radiation will have a, a potential role there for immune modulatory effects as well so in all these ways radiation is easier to incorporate as well as logistically because there is also now Uh, apart from treating the primary prostate there is also a, a trend nowadays with more trials coming up more um, uh, phase 1 phase 2 trials are ongoing regard towards a metastasis directed radiation treatment in uh, even in the prostate uh, cancer setting where like uh, dr ginel was saying there are treatable lesions when you have treatable metastatic lesions apart from targeting the primary prostate disease you also target the metastatic lesions the focal uh, metastatic lesions with Uh, ablative kind of radiation therapy, which we refer to as stereotactic body radiation therapy (SBR), SBRT, uh, which can give very ablative kind of curative doses to these metastatic lesions. So, up to five lesions uh, or four to five lesions, oligometastatic treatable lesions can also be now uh, considered for uh, is also that there is also a trend towards that. But there is no phase three data like in the case of primary prostate radiation treatment. There are ongoing phase one or promising phase one, phase two data that has come up, but it needs to be. Uh, uh, we need to see whether that is beneficial with regard to survival as well as uh, local control uh, when it comes to uh, in a uh, longer follow up as well as in a much more stronger evidence wise in a phase three trial. So we have phase one, phase two evidences for metastasis directed RT. We have reasonably good quality evidence to recommend. Uh, radiation to the primary prostate in an oligometastatic disease, and that would be a preferable option uh, 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 for a, as a local treatment for the prostate compared to surgery because it's much more easier to incorporate radiation to the prostate as well as to the uh, metastatic sites simultaneously. Okay, sir. So I think, I think the recent the stampy data. I think what you showed is uh, the uh, initial results. I think in the uh, current the stampy results, data, yeah, there is actually twelve twelve percent uh, survival benefit in the low volume uh, the low volume metastatic group. Five year overall survival of around twelve uh, percent in absolute increment. So there, therefore, I think there is a that that is a very standard uh, uh, treatment policy nowadays, even in our institution, to uh, offer local radiation treatment for a, a good performance status patient. Okay, sir. So I think we have covered radiation also uh, along with that. So just uh, just touch upon uh, medical aspect. So Nikhil, sir, how would you approach this patient of oligometastatic? And if you were to choose between the various options, chemotherapy, abiratron, and zolotomide, what will you what will your preference be, and how do you choose between them? Okay, <clears throat> in this forum, since we are having academic discussion. i think my initial now we are when we are talking about a low burden disease or as we said oligometastatic disease it is a patient who need a systemic therapy now the standard previous standard of care used to be adt alone used to be the systemic therapy but we really and also rt used to be added on but we know that that we another third agent is required stampede has shown the benefit of adding uh, uh, docetaxel six cycles along with the uh, 
radiation in this uh, setting and there was a benefit of almost uh, 20% hazard ratio was around 80 at the same time the other arms of stampede has also shown that abrotron is also uh, has done very well in this cut, uh, current setting similarly as a, another trial with enzalutumab enzamat has shown a very good uh, almost a 30% re reduction in uh, risk in terms of overall survival when compared to patients treated with ADT alone. If we, while we don't have a head-on uh, comparison between uh, the two agents, that is a chemotherapy versus a androgen, uh, you know, and androgen receptor signaling inhibitor, I would say that if you look at it, the stampede, the abrotron had a hazard ratio of 0 0.69 versus 0 0.8 for the chemotherapy arm. So, and generally the toxicity is much lesser. The overall toxicity is much lesser for a, a novel anti-androgen compared uh, like enzalutamide abritron compared to docetaxel. So generally my preference would be uh, to give an um, either abritron or enzalutamide along with the consolidation RT to the prostate. Now, is docetaxel... Uh, uh, still, is there a role for docetaxel in a oligometastatic or a low burden disease? I would say yes. One issue in our country, a resource poor country, and even in a lot of other countries where European countries where cost is a factor, you have docetaxel, which is the finite treatment. You have a fixed six cycle. So they finish the treatment in four and a half months. And uh, cost uh, in our setting, we are finishing the cost with 50,000 rupees. But as Abratron, you will be taking till progression. And uh, hence, the financial toxicity is the only, I mean, one aspect about abritron and enzalutamide. We don't use apalutamide much, so I won't comment about it. Okay. Uh, would, you like a, would you like to make a comment on the PEACE trial, which has combined ADT plus doxtaxel and abritron? What is the current... Uh, Results of yes. this and how uh, it can affect. I, I, so in this, I would actually discuss peace in the setting of the peace one trial, and you have the other uh, with the darolotamide and docetaxel. That is the RSN trial, which has a massive survival benefit, and even a radiological progression free survival benefit. I would discuss this in the setting Probably of uh, high burden yeah. disease, okay. because the absolute benefit was shown in those settings. In a low burden, it was. In fact, there was, uh, you only added, I mean, there was no benefit at all. So it doesn't make okay. sense adding a triplet uh, regime in the setting. So I think we've already discussed the medical and radiation aspects and already talked about the stampede trials. Uh, one word from uh, Bindu, madam. Uh, what would be the importance of ductal and cribriform patterns in a prostate biopsy? And what would be the importance? Okay. Uh, can you please uh, change the slide? Yeah. Uh, if I have to talk about the ductal adenocarcinoma, these are a subset of tumors uh, wherein uh, you, you get to see that the tumor is forming large ducts or asini. And within these larger ducts, you would see that it's either forming cribriform pattern or papillae formations. The second image, the B image would show the cribriform pattern. And probably if you look at the image E, that is showing within the larger dilated duct, you are seeing finger-like projections uh, of cells protruding into the dilated lumina of the duct. Uh, so what is the importance of identifying this is? And in uh, uh, um, um, like as uh, um, opposed to the SNR ductal, uh, uh, sorry, the SNR adenocarcinoma of the prostate, um, the incidence of picking up ductal adenocarcinoma is less. But nevertheless, it is important because uh, it, uh, this, this subset, whenever there is, it, uh, it usually occurs in combination with the SNR adenocarcinoma. Rarely you get to see it uh, as, as a standalone ductal adenocarcinoma. Usually it is in combination. And whenever there is a, ductal, uh, a component of ductal adenocarcinoma, you would see that uh, uh, the behavior is more aggressive than having an SNR adenocarcinoma alone. And... Um, and um, uh, at the genetic level also, uh, as opposed to the SNR adenocarcinoma, the ductal adenocarcinomas shows uh, loss of peat and loss. Uh, um, um, and also there is high uh, percentage of DNA, uh, uh, damage, uh, uh, DNA repair, uh, damage repair pathway alteration also in case of 
ductal uh, prostatic ductal adenocarcinoma so that is the importance and when you see ductal adenocarcinoma in a prostate biopsy you have to quantify it and tell how much how much of how many percentage of the tumor is comprising of the uh, ductal adenocarcinoma so that is the importance uh, it is aggressive and uh, uh, over to the next question uh, the importance of cribriform pattern cribriform as i uh, showed in the, in the first case cribriform is a pattern when you see that there is a sheet sheet of cells this sheet of cells are intervened by uh, um, uh, by uh, glandular luminae okay so this is the cribriform pattern and cribriform pattern uh, has shown uh, it is shown that it is an independent predictor of biochemical recurrence metastasis and also the cancer specific survival and as per the 2019 isup update um, um, the isup 2019 Uh, recommends reporting the presence of cribriform pattern and also the amount of cribriform pattern and uh, um, also if you see, get to see the cribriform pattern that also warrants a genetic uh, workup like the uh, hrr uh, gene uh, alteration should be tested because uh, the cribriform pattern is uh, associated with an alteration or mutation in the hrr gene so that is the significance and not only that when i talk about the cribriform pattern there are many 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 uh, situations wherein you can get a, get to see a cribriform pattern in the in the prostate it could represent it could be a cribriform pattern of an snr adenocarcinoma it could be a cribriform pattern of a ductal adenocarcinoma uh, you it could be a cribriform high grade pin or it could be a cribriform pattern of the intraductal uh, idcp that is intraductal carcinoma prostate so each of these carries uh, a varied prognosis prognosis so we need to know what actually uh, is it depicting and if you have a high index of suspicion of a high grade uh, pin or an idcp you have to make use of uh, immunohistochemical markers like p63 uh, to see whether there is uh, either focal or complete re uh, retainment of the basal layer so these are the importance and the implications of understanding or uh, understanding the cribriform pattern anything more dr vishnu no that's um, good ma'am thank you uh, one more point i will uh, highlight is uh, one uh, the ductal carcinoma is considered to be one of the factors uh, uh, an indication for genetic screening uh, somatic yes. screening so it is yeah. actually there are a lot of uh, alteration happens now yeah, we can proceed okay so just what the guidelines say this is with regard to metastatic not specific to oligometastatic so i think we have already discussed this i will not go into detail again so just a few few points Uh, definitions there are many definitions like uh, sir has told based on chartered and latitude trials abiraterone enzalutamide plus adt has shown a good benefit in low volume diseases especially oligometastatic surgery only in very selected cases there is uh, less data regarding surgery in oligometastatic and radio uh, radiotherapy as dr aridas mentioned there's a overall survival benefit in low volume metastatic as per the chartered criteria so i think we can take the questions for case 2 if there are any uh, okay. i think almost all the cases are uh, okay. all the questions are discussed except okay. one uh, that is regarding adt probably we can take it up along with the case 3 okay so i'll directly go to the case 3 so case 3 we have a 62 year old male patient who is hypertensive uh, just one more uh, this one i think in the previous uh, in the systemic treatment i think chemo is also A valid option in metastatic disease. So yes, chemo sir. or abiraterone or enzalutamide plus ADT. Okay. So, Chemotherapy still has a role in this setting. They all have a benefit, yes, so. survival benefit, with they have compared to ADT alone. Um, so and in our uh, setting, definitely upfront docetaxel also has a role. So intensifying the systemic treatment with either one of these agents is uh, the is. Uh, is uh, yeah, beneficial even in the oligometastatics yeah. okay so this third case he is also a cardiac patient underwent angioplasty 5 years back he is on a single antiplatelet he has come to us with obstructive lutz since 3 months all symptoms started back in 2017 he had also had irritated lutz in the form of frequency and nocturia he had a high ips score he had no significant family history and rectal examination showed a hard prostate his initial psa was 
MRI pelvis was done, which showed an ill-defined infiltrative lesion at the peripheral zone at the base. It was infiltrating the seminal vesicles and the neurovascular bundles on both sides. There was again infiltration seen in, into the rectum, and there were multiple bilateral internal iliac perirectal nodes and left internal iliac nodes measuring approximately 1.6 centimeters. So we did a truss guided biopsy, which showed a Gleason 4 plus 5 with a grade group of 5. Uh, a bone scan was done in this case, which was negative. So a diagnosis of locally advanced CA prostate was made with a CT4A and N1 status. So this patient, we gave, we started him on hormone therapy and he underwent a radiotherapy after two or three injections. The PSA before his RT was 0.42. But however, after his RT sessions, his PSA started to rise again. So as we can see, RT was given approximately around June 2018. In September, November and December, the PSA started to rise. And his last PSA was 2.7. Uh, we did a testosterone at this, at this time to confirm his castration and it confirmed a castration status. So with view of rising PSA, we did a PET scan to look for any metastasis and it showed multiple metastasis. That is, there was abnormal uptake in the left femur, in the left scapula and in multiple vertebrae. So he had multiple bone lesions in multiple vertebrae, femur, iliac bone and scapula. And he had multiple lymph nodes in the paraortic, non-regional lymph nodes Petrocaval common iliac. So a, a diagnosis of metastatic CRPC was done, was made with a PSA of 2.7. Now he started developing back pain and pain in the left leg. A DEXA scan was highly suggested to osteoporosis. His creatinine at that time was 1.4. At this point, I just want to uh, tell the students about definition of CRPC, which is a commonly asked question in exams. So CRPC definition has to start with a testosterone level of less than 50 nanogram per deciliter later or 1.7 nanomoles. So we have to see what units they are using. And it either includes biochemical progression, that is three rises in PSA at least one week apart, resulting in 250% increases over the NADIR and a PSA more than two. Or, or a radiological progression, that is appearance of new lesions, either two or more new lesions on bone scan or a soft tissue lesion using the RESIS criteria. So in this case also, we can see that the PSA value was slowly increasing the PSA value had reached more than two. There was two, two subsequent values increasing every monthly. And also there was radiological progression. So it fits into both, both definitions of CRPC in this case. So how do, we, how do we manage this case of metastatic CRPC? So first I will ask Bindu ma'am again, in this case of four plus five, what would be the role of synaptophysin immunohistochemistry in this patient? And what, and if you can talk a little bit about genetic analysis and molecular analysis and their importance in such patients. Okay, over to the, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, over to the first question. Um, whenever we, uh, like uh, there is a report of four plus five and the pattern five is uh, not the gland, uh, glandular pattern with comedo necrosis. It is more in like a, a poorly differentiated kind of cells as sheets. That is when, like, uh, some uh, uh, with a vague resemblance to the to a small cell carcinoma. That is when we uh, like start thinking morphologically whether the tumor harbors a neuroendocrine differentiation, uh, because uh, a tumor with a neuroendocrine differentiation is clinically bad. So we have to like uh, prove or disprove that with an IHC, uh, which we use as a synaptophysin. Synaptophysin is a marker which uh, for neuroendocrine differentiation. So if it shows a positivity for synaptophysin, you have to call that as a uh, prostatic SNR adenocarcinoma with a neuroendocrine differentiation. Um, um, and uh, if it is like, uh, if we don't see any SNR adenocarcinoma, uh, then it could be a pure neuroendocrine carcinoma. It depends on the, sometimes it's so uh, difficult to differentiate whether it is pure uh, uh, neuroendocrine or an SNR adeno with a neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, in that setting, we uh, we quite often use um, uh, IHC markers like a PSA and a marker. 
if there are cells which uh, shows up uh, positivity for a marker then it is a, uh, a snr adeno pattern 5 with a neuroendocrine differentiation so that is the utility of cyanotrophicin and uh, um, over to the next question that is the about the genetic testing in uh, ca prostate as far as my understanding goes uh, we uh, decide on uh, getting a genetic test done uh, in uh, in certain uh, clinical situations uh, first is like uh, when the tumor is so aggressive uh, with the uh, metastasis at presentation or if it is a young age individual with a clinically advanced tumor or a tu um, um, an a young individual with a, a, a family history of tumor in the immediate uh, relatives it could be tumor in the prostate or it could be um, a tumor in the breast pancreas ovary etc so these are the situations wherein we decide to get a genetic analysis done and uh, this is very important because uh, it uh, gives a lot of information regarding the prognosis and also the treatment options and also give implications for the family counseling and uh, as you can see there are various molecular methods which are used for the prognosis response to therapy and also uh, to take the decision whether an active surveillance uh, would suffice so these are there are uh, uh, different gene panels which are like the prolaris decipher or oncotype dx um, um, with regard to the prolaris uh, it's actually a geno genomic test wherein uh, you uh, assess about 46 genes and uh, which is used for the risk assessment and also gives information uh, about the likelihood of the uh, progression of the tumor and uh, uh, another one, like uh, you can also use uh, uh, simple measures like uh, KI-67, et cetera, to understand the aggressiveness of the tumor. And uh, maybe you can also uh, venture for a fish-based analysis where you can analyze uh, uh, the uh, Tempress ERG fusion, uh, which is one of the earlier uh, like uh, uh, but, uh, uh, genetic alterations that happens. And uh, uh, this is actually considered as an aggressive phenotype. And uh, a subset of tumors uh, are also shown to um, um, express, uh, show some DNA repair related gene mutations either in BRCA1 or BRCA2. And also, as I told uh, before, some tumors may also show, next, uh, next slide please, uh, some tumors also show uh, alterations or uh, in the homologous re recombination repair gene, that is HR gene, and um, uh, about 10 percentage of which uh, are germline. And uh, about uh, five percentage of the metastatic tumors also exhibit uh, um, microsatellite instability. So you you can we have also provision either an IHC based test or uh, genetic analysis to uh, to uh, understand whether the tumor shows any microsatellite instability. So these are my understanding. Probably uh, the clinical uh, the Dr. Ginnell and uh, Dr. Hari, Dr. Haridas can add more on this. This is my understanding. I don't have a hands-on experience about this. And moreover, a cribriform pattern in any tumor warrants an, uh, an HRG mutation assessment. Uh, Gidal, sir, would you like to add any points about clinical importance of genetic screening? No, as uh, Dr. Bindu told, one is uh, uh, there are two aspects. One is the genetic uh, screening. One is the somatic screening. Somatic screening is in the tissue uh, because there are a lot of mutation happens when the disease progress. More mutation happens when they become CRPC. So if there is any family history of uh, uh, suggestive of Lynch syndrome or uh, BRCA uh, 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 mutation, then we have to go in that line. Uh, in the germ line. Otherwise, somatic mutation followed by identifying the issue, then screening for the genetic mutation is the way in which we usually proceed. This is very important because uh, new medicines has come based on this in advanced cases when the rest of the treatment is over. So this is getting more important. These are the important points we have to remember about uh, uh, genetic mutation. Sir, may I add sir? something, sir, regarding... Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, as sir mentioned that I think the genetic mutation has taken a role. There is a genetic screening, um, more than the genetic screening, actually the somatic screening, which has a particular importance to us, especially in the setting of a uh, castration resistance. So generally the mutation analysis, that is the homologous uh, repair gene uh, mutations, that are HRD gene mutations, the MSI, microsatellite instability, 
or and even if you can send for a next gen sequencing uh, next gen sequencing looking at the tumor mutation but now all these are done definitely they have to be done in your first crpc setting but they can also in a even ncsn recommends while not a strong regulation they can be done in a upfront setting maybe for the younger uh, you know uh, younger patient population and also patients with a high burden of disease and uh, maybe also some of the pathological factors like the cutter form i mean uh, the pattern etc may uh, give us clues on uh, whether any additional genetic screening needs to be done okay so for i'll the just germline, to... yeah just for uh, no, no, copying the germline uh, testing will be done by your peripheral blood and uh, somatic mutation will be done on your biopsy bar surgical specimen okay <clears throat> so coming back to this case of metastatic crpc i like to ask nikhil sir what are the treatment options to consider at this stage is a hormone therapy required in a castration resistant prostate cancer <clears throat> and would regarelix be preferred in this case and how will you a few points about assessing fitness for chemotherapy if you are planning for chemotherapy yeah first and foremost the most important thing when now this patient is a crpc a metastatic crpc and the most important thing i would like to point out is that even though we have labeled them based on our definition as a castration resistant there is absolutely no indication or or we should continue the androgen they we should continue the androgen uh, deprivation at no point should we stop it you can also offer if the patient is on an agonist you can offer to switch up the, of course the data for that is uh, very weak offer to switch up and give a antagonist or you can even offer surgical castration but at no point should we stop adt because the tumor even though you feel uh, you know there's so much of heterogeneity in the prostatic tumor there will still be some areas which are responsible uh, to the androgen deprivation now what are the treatment options to consider in a patient who has just been labeled metastatic uh, crpc it depends on uh, the first of all the first line treatment depends on what was previously offered was it a de novo diagnosis or is a patient previously treated with some radiation bar even as I, we have already mentioned the previous cases you know that the locally advanced patients have an option of receiving abritron that is a novel anti androgen so these uh, are the uh, factors which come into play while considering therapy yes patient factors uh, also come into play such as the performance status the potential toxicities of the treatment uh, vis a vis the uh, comorbidities of the patient and of course at the end of it the cost uh, calculation and the uh, duration of treatment etc uh, come into the play i mean patients who have not been treated we have both options of going with uh, patient crpc patient who has not been treated with the systemic therapy along with the adt your options remain uh, you know you have option of either going for a androgen receptor signaling inhibitor that could be your abiratron or degarelix or even darolutamide apalutamide or we would uh, we can also go ahead with docetaxel in the first line setting now when you come to assessing patients whether they are fit for chemotherapy there is no specific rules in fact there is no uh, single set of uh, protocols like unlike you have for cisplatin where you can um, label the patient whether is fit or not but the general rules include performance status again the comorbidities cardiac renal Uh, hepatic and uh, because a lot of times age is not a factor a lot of time the chronological uh, age may not uh, match the physiological age so those would be the few things we would consider by assessing fitness for chemotherapy and as i mentioned hormone therapy has to be there it is a backbone of your therapy even in a crpc now so in in this case what would be your first option that you would give the patient the number one treatment you would suggest now in this patient he is a crpc in a crpc the triplet therapy which we mentioned in the castration sensitive high burden patients are not exactly studied maybe we may have trials coming up in a crpc patient who is fit uh, i mean angioplasty is not a contraindication for any any form of treatment whether it is adt or the novel androgens anti androgens or your chemotherapy i would definitely 
consider giving him docetaxel. If there is any contraindication to docetaxel, then I would put him on uh, antiandrogens. Now, okay. generally, there is no data regarding what is the best sequencing. There are multiple studies going. There are a lot of some meta-analysis. There is a general belief, I mean, based on some few meta-analysis that uh, abritron followed by docetaxel has a shorter uh, progression-free period compared to docetaxel followed by abritron. Basic patients who are exposed to abritron may not uh, have a good response to docetaxel. What is the uh, logic behind it? We are not able to explain. This is all retrospective analysis, not prospective. Okay. Uh, Ginil, sir, a few points about bone health. I mentioned the DEXA scan was showing a high risk of osteoporosis. So especially in patients receiving uh, long-term hormone therapy, how do we manage the bone health in such patients? So I'll uh, just uh, uh, discuss one more point here because there was a question by Dr. Sinha about uh, how to, one basic question, how to start, how to decide about which ADT we have to give in a uh, metastatic uh, scenario. So uh, between orchectomy, anti-androgens, uh, anti-androgens, uh, uh, GnRH analogs and uh, antagonists, uh, there are some basic difference, uh, but uh, uh, between bicalutamide or anti-androgen and uh, other form of uh, hormone treatment, bicalutamide and loperide in the study, we found that overall survival was low in bicalutamide. So there was a study. So bicalutamide is not considered as a standard uh, uh, monotherapy for uh, androgen deprivation. So what we have to do is usually a lupulite or some uh, uh, analogs, DNR analogs. We initially give bicalutamide till the flare happens. Then we go on to uh, uh, analogs in and uh, uh, antagonists. A initial bicalutamide may not be required because they are not acting in that line. So probably we can directly start with uh, 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 antagonists. In orchidomy also, a priming with uh, any androgen is not anti-androgen is not required because the flare-up phenomenon doesn't happen. So this is the basic things about different anti-androgen and selection in cardiac toxic, cardiac issues. There is some data to say that Deerlix is beneficial that is based on the pooled data analysis of different studies of Tiger Lips. And there is a, a prospective study of low uh, number of patients saying that antagonist has got less cardiac side effects than uh, agonist. So these are the important points about different ADT. Regarding bone health, uh, recently EAU recommends assessment of bone health before starting a ADT. Uh, there are some uh, Frank's uh, uh, nomograms to assess the bone health, then uh, 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 cancer fracture. Uh, then uh, we have got uh, uh, you know, DEXA scans to assess the bone health. So this is a high risk, according to the, uh, uh, these are patients are very high risk for fracture. So if there is any osteoporosis that has to be treated according to the general guideline of the osteoporosis, where we will uh, start to start zoldronic acid or uh, denosumab in the treatment uh, uh, for the treatment of CA prostate is only in CRPC, not in hormone sensitive. Only in CRPC, either denosumab or uh, zoldronic has shown that there is a reduction in fracture rate. So treatment of osteoporosis and uh, in the CRPC are different because in osteoporosis, we give these agents once in six months, but in, uh, uh, in preventing skeletal events in CRPC, it is every month. At least 12 months is the one that is studied. So we usually give at least for 12 months. Along with that, we have to assess two things. One is creatine and calcium because these agents can cause hypocalcemia. So calcium has to be monitored. And creatine is a relative contraindication for soldronic acid. And in denosumab, in lower level creatine uh, clearance also, denosumab has got less side effects. Another thing is we have to have a dental assessment for caries because these patients have 
joint necrosis, uh, especially zoledronic acid, and also report in Dinosmar. These are the important points. One, on CRPC only, these agents are, bone modifying agents are given as a treatment to reduce the schedule events. We have to screen the bone health for osteoporosis, and if there is osteoporosis, we have to treat osteoporosis dosage. Third thing is a dental assessment is required, a creatinine and calcium is required. Okay. So uh, coming to radiation for bone meds, is there any role of radiation to bone metastasis for any palliative reason in a high volume metastatic disease? So, uh, unlike in the uh, locally advanced non-metastatic as well as the oligometastatic disease, in a uh, high-volume metastatic disease, CR, uh, CRPC, the role for radiation is mainly palliation. Uh, there is no curative agent treatment with radiation possible, as the systemic treatment is the only option. So, generally, we look at the symptomatic lesions or likely to cause some, sometimes there is an impending cord compression or there is a very symptomatic painful lesion. We would focus our palliative radiation to those areas, usually 20 grain, 5 fractions, or 30 grain, 10 fractions, which are reasonably uh, adequate to give a safe uh, dose, but at the same time achieve the palliation effect of uh, pain relief. Uh, there are certain scenarios there used to be, though the practice has changed with uh, more of uh, uh, lutetium therapy and PSMA therapy coming up. Uh, when there are extensive skeletal metastasis, there used to be a practice of hemibody radiation being given for as a palliative treatment for patients with extensive skeletal meds causing severe pain, uh, unlocalizable pain due to marrow infiltrative disease. So there used to be practice of uh, hemibody radiation also. So mostly it will be palliative intent. Uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, there are very certain, very individualized cases where in a CRPC situation also, we sometimes get an oligoprogressive or an oligorecurrent kind of uh, metastatic CRPC. In such rare situations, there is a though there is no data or there is no uh, there are only retrospective uh, series on such uh, scenarios. Uh, there can be an individualized decision can be de taken regarding same how in the hormone sensitive prostate cancer whether those oligo recurrent or oligo progressive metastatic lesions can be targeted with ablative radiation like SVRT. So that is also an option, but that is a very rare scenario that we see. Uh, and not a very common scenario that we come across. But with more and more, more PSMA PET scans being done, uh, I think that uh, the incidence of such uh, cases are increasing compared to before. So I think that is also one upcoming role uh, for radiation, just like in the oligometastatic scenario in hormone sensitive. In the CRPC also, there is a, a scope for oligoprogressive and oligorecurrent metastatic uh, CRPC. I think that will be the main uh, role for radiation in such a scenario. Okay. So this patient was actually advised uh, doxetaxel and various options, but however, patient was not initially very much keen and had refused chemotherapy. Uh, so we had started him on abiratron 1000 milligrams and also on zoledronic acid for his bone health. <clears throat> the lupular injections were continued. His PSA slightly had decreased from 2.7 to 0.37, but slowly, by November 2019, it started rising again, became 1.1, and by December, it became again 2.8. So uh, he was not very keen on continuing the injection. So he underwent an orchidectomy in 2020, January. And even after orchidectomy and uh, post uh, follow up, the PSA was slowly rising to 3.8. Another PET scan done in June 2020 showed new uh, non regional nodes in the iotocable and paratracheal nodes. There were new bone lesions in the occiput, sternum, and multiple vertebrae, uh, humerus, left rib, and multiple ribs. So at this at this at this stage, when do we when do we decide to reimage or reevaluate progression? That is radiological progression metastatic CRPC, and what would be the role of rebiopsy in such patients who are progressing beyond further treatments? So regarding uh, re-image or re-evaluate is one, when there is a definite progression that necessitates an alteration in the change or change of management, we have to have a baseline uh, uh, radiological evaluation because we have to quantify the progression. And from there, the, whether the new treatment is giving any benefit, we have to assess. So there should be a radiological evaluation whenever there is a definite progression either symptomatic 
or a, a clinical process is required is the which requires a change in management we have to have a reevaluation otherwise in trials it was used every 18 months they had a, 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 a evaluation but is the trial but in the clinical uh, scenario we use it when there is a symptomatic progression or when there is a progression uh, either uh, 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 like a psa progression which requires a reevaluation and change of management in those scenario only we go for a uh, uh, or a another image so any role for rebiopsy uh, there are new medicines uh, which are available in advanced setting when other treatment are like olaparib rupaparib etc so for that actually a genetic study is required only in hrr positive patients these are found to be beneficial so in those scenario a rebiopsy is required if uh, uh, when there is a disparity in uh, the clinical uh, like what we are expecting is a slow progression like a low grade tumor and suddenly the patient is having a uh, 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 progression then we may have to like is a gleason 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3 and the patient is showing a metastasis then we may have to assume the initial part is uh, not right and any progression we have to it is better to have one more bath so rebiopsy is basically if you are planning for a, a, a targeted treatment uh, based on genetic alteration or if you are seeing that disparity between the clinical progression uh, from the clinical scenario we expect am i uh, any more points you want uh, vishnu no no sir that's uh, good enough. so in this patient uh, nikhil sir what options would you consider next patient has failed these therapies and a few points about how to sequence drugs in crpc now the sequencing now coming to the second line treatment in a crpc patient systemically as mentioned already this patient is castrated and that is another thing to just keep in check we may you know while treating it systemically may forget about the backbone adt especially if they are on luperlaid or something which is happening once in 3 months once in 6 months now regarding sequencing of drug in this particular patient since he has received a novel anti androgen the next uh, line of treatment i would prefer provided he is uh, fit would be docetaxel chemotherapy docetaxel for around 6 cycles at 75 mg per meter square now generally there is no uh, written i mean there is no written down consensus uh, among the various associations like how to sequence it but there is a unwritten uh, rule that you know once you have tried uh, one mode of action and it has failed that is a novel i mean this thing androgen signaling pathway and you can try then the cytotoxic uh, treatment so the logical step in this particular patient would be since he has received abiraterone the next treatment would be docetaxel uh, such patients of course uh, who are not uh, you know fit for chemotherapy Uh, we may try treatment with enzalutamide, uh, which I genuinely believe may be, uh, I mean, which may be an inferior option. Now, coming to let us say the patient has progressed, the same patient has progressed on docetaxel. I again would have considered the patient for abiraterone or enzalutamide. Now, what happens in the third line when they have progressed? They have received a taxin that is docetaxel, and they have received uh, an uh, Anti andro, I mean, this is novel anti androgen like abiraterone and enzalutamide. What do you do then next? Now, this is where the option get tricky. You have the option of considering. Let us say you have used abiraterone docetaxel, and the patient has progressed. You have an option of again trying enzalutamide, which is easily accessible to us, or you have an option of cytotoxic chemotherapy such as cabazitaxel. Now, there was a CARD trial. Uh, I think 2019. Uh, published card trial which helped uh, you know select the patients who have uh, who can undergo cabazitaxel now they included the uh, ps2 patients also there was a focus on the ps uh, performance status two patients now these are patients who all received uh, docetaxel and who also received one uh, line of uh, androgen receptor inhibitor that is either it was abiraterone or enzalutamide now Uh, they compared this 
uh, these patients when one arm there was prednisolone and cabazitaxel along with the other arm was either the patients who received abrotron it was enzalutamide and patients who received uh, enzalutamide it was abrotron now there was an almost and doubled there was a eight month progression free survival benefit eight month versus four months in the cabazitaxel arm so in a patient who has already received a taxane who has progressed for less than 12 month duration of a uh, you know uh, androgen receptor signaling inhibitor i think cabazitaxel would be the logical third uh, line choice compared to another agent such as enzalutamide or you know darolutamide etc thank you i think we have to wind up in 5 minutes we'll just uh, go through the uh, uh, new advance in uh, lutetium or uh, this one if you want yes, to so in in, in in i think at the end of this also one more treatment line one year progress multiple line we have the vision trial which uh, had a lutetium therapy given to patients versus the pro what was the standard of care the standard of care includes both chemo uh, even mitoxantron um, and even uh, other novel anti androgens now here uh, they had basically an uh, imaging radiological progression free survival and overall survival benefit and at the time as right now there is an overall survival benefit um, uh, you compared to the other lines so these are patients who are multiply treated they received a tri taxane maybe and also an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor so lutetium therapy also is an option especially for symptomatic patients with a poor performance status that is three or more and of course uh, in this setting we also you know when you we get a lot of patients who are multiply treated let's say uh, patients are not able to afford lutetium therapy etc we still have a role for as a palliative role for mitoxantron and anthracycline based chemotherapy uh, even in this setting our older progestins estrogens hormonal therapy may play a role whether it uh, role as a placebo or not i'm not very sure we used to have the radium 223 treatment now it is not a i mean ever since lutetium was come it is generally not a standard care but is used for palliating bone lesions so in effect we have a lot of options uh, uh, even olaparib is coming is olaparib so when we come to just a quick word on the targeted therapy patients who have a, as i mentioned crpc as soon as you enter a crpc setting uh, uh, Like after which will be dropped from the study. Yeah, I think this is the criteria for under. Yeah, so we have the options of a uh, PARP inhibitor that is Rukaparib or Olaparib. In case the patient has an MSI, we have the option of immunotherapy with pembrolizumab. Okay. So these would be the current uh, targeted therapies that we have in our armamentarium. If you have the facility to do a next gen sequencing, we can offer based on that. you may get some off so, uh, target uh, mutations that's all. so these are the important points regarding the treatment of advanced uh, uh, ca prostate uh, uh, vishnu uh, shall we uh, yes, wind sir. up i think uh, almost yeah, everything we have yeah covered. yeah acha okay. jinil um, i think you have covered all the scenarios very nicely uh, these scenarios we faced uh, day in and day out when we were sitting in opd Uh, when we evaluate in the beginning and the all the questions, I think we we come across with these questions. But a few questions which come to my mind, uh, which probably we've already discussed, but uh, a little more clarity we need from your end because uh, uh, the full team or board is there. Um, you think there is some disturbance, isn't that right? There is some disturbance from background. Uh, somebody's mic is on, I think. I think I think there is uh, one more video on or audio on. I think uh, Dr. Arun. One minute. I'll check it. Just one minute. Now, uh, Jinil, the question here is: Many patients come to us in the initial stages only with the catheter. Now, you, I am talking about a scenario of metastatic gastric nerve prostate cancer. so he is on adt plus minus up front uh, whatever abrotron and zolotamide so what do you do with the tension you are in your practical scenario the tension sir yeah uh, so uh, if the patient uh, is uh, 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 majority of the patient we may have go for a channel trp if the patient fit otherwise uh, we used to give a palliative radiation also in some of the patients if uh, he is not responding to uh, 
uh, uh, responding to hormone treatment and if he's not a candidate for uh, uh, a TRP, if he is so sick. This, this TRP or radiation uh, you do after how much weeks of uh, uh, ADT? Let us say in a common scenario yeah. like us, I have done an arcectomy. Okay. And the patient is sent back, he is so, still on catheter. One month catheter pre-trial again failed. Yeah. So usually I sit for around two months because beyond that, patient will be, uh, it will be difficult to uh, manage with the catheter. If he's fit for procedure, after two catheter removal, I usually, there's no standard criteria, but thing is the patient, uh, 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 beyond two months, if he's not responding, I feel that response will be uh, not much. So we can proceed with uh, 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 TORP because the benign complaint may be the main factor which is uh, causing the trouble. Okay. Is there any way we can predict that this is because of a benign component or it's because of malignant component? Or so any one special is the PSA, hmm. yeah, PSA response is good, but hmm. the patient is not voiding. Probably the benign component is a factor. If yeah. uh, PR wise, there is a uh, large prostate, the PSA is not very high. Uh, probably uh, it may be the benign component. So, and the low grade tumor, if there is a large prostate, then uh, probably there is a benign component also. So it is basically uh, different factors we consider. Uh, uh, basically, it is if the response is not good, we will assume that there can be benign component. Okay. Uh, we have a scenario where uh, uh, we have a hematuria, uh, which is not responding even after orchectomy. Uh, patient is going into repeated bladder wash, clot tension and all that. So what is your advice on these patients? So, uh, there are some patients like that for us. We usually just do a scopy, try to uh, coagulate. If it's not responding, we usually ask uh, Haridas to come and uh, help us by giving a hemostatic radiation. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, Janil, this is, again, uh, I have seen very few uh, cases um, in the last six months where I was not getting the good response. To the uh, this is, again, the background of... Uh, post orchectomy status where the PSA starts rising and patient comes to us with the rising creatinine. We do an MRI, the, the upper tracts are mildly dilated, mildly dilated uh, um, ureter. Uh, you, you, you go and try to stent and leave the renal failure, nothing works. PCN, uh, the system is not dilated. Radiology people are unable to do. In this scenario, what do you do? You mean uh, PCN is not possible and... Uh... Uh, yeah, uh, the, yeah means, uh, the intervention, whether anti-grade or retrograde is not possible because of the disease, uh, um, it's because of retropanil or it's because of the poor uh, landmarks in the bladder, it's not possible. So how do you manage the renal failure in these patients? No, if nothing is possible, only option will be to have a uh, substitution by hemodialysis or something. I can't uh, uh, think of any other option. But uh, uh, I feel that uh, putting the patient in the hemodialysis in advanced progress in disease uh, uh, means it is, act, uh, it is actually leaving the patient for suffering from the disease. So I usually counsel the patient about the futility of uh, all this treatment and benefits of having a, a renal failure, having a, a short life in the suffering setting. So I counsel the patient properly in this scenario where there is a progressive renal failure in spite of all other management than putting him on dialysis or uh, uh, some other treatment. Uh, one more question. In, in practical scenario, Indian setting, uh, in a castrate sensitive uh, metastatic prostate cancer, your initial form of treatment is orchectomy or medical orchectomy, surgical or medical? So uh, I usually put all the options in front of the patient. If the patient is willing, and if there, there are a lot of patients who cannot have a bystander who can come frequently. So in those patients, according to the patient convenience, patients, uh, you know, uh, mental status, what they want, all these things are considered financial status. All these things are cardiac status. All these things are considered before I advise for a hormone treatment. So if there is a cardiac patient, I prefer a Digerlix if he is willing for a monthly injection. Otherwise, if the patient cannot come frequently, I prefer an orchectomy. When the patient is getting advanced, like multiple treatment are required due to financial reason, I suggest an orchectomy rather than continuing the hormone. The patient is not decided on, I start on hormone. And whenever the patient is decided, I go for orchectomy. 
so there is a lot of flexibility in the management of uh, because everything seems to be almost equal except for the projected benefit of uh, digitalics in the cardiac top system okay uh, if everything is okay now uh, what is the psa value you are looking after degerlex agonist and orchectomy post operatively uh, uh orchectomy actually we uh, get within uh, one or two days we start this thing whether uh, there is only one or two di- days difference in the action of digerlex and orchectomy there is a quick acting tooth uh, modality so if there is any acute cord compression or uh, something either of these things i if we have got a biopsy we usually go for a orchectomy if it is not no biopsy is required uh, we prefer to go for a digerlex because of the medical legal implication that can happen if the patient is taking the risk accept uh, that uh, orchectomy can be done in spite of the absence of a histopathological diagnosis we go for orchectomy otherwise we proceed with the digerlex if there is no biopsy possible for a patient who has a cord compression if the patient is not ready to accept the risk of uh, accept the uh, treatment without a uh, 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 histopathological diagnosis we get a consent of uh, uh, not having a histopathological uh, uh, diagnosis in acute cases uh, we say that because of the clinical scenario we assume that this is the only possibility we are ready to uh, accept the uh, consequence and proceed with our patient otherwise we go for digerlex in acute cord compression and uh, acute uh, obstruction of the ureter or a, a retention or if there is any cardiac problem. Uh, now, Jinil, the question is, how much PSA decline you expect after orchectomy and after medical work? So majority of the case, the PSA comes down to uh, 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 even close to zero. Uh, but this is actually a criteria for response. so there is no hard and fast rule how much it will come but majority will come to within uh, 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 one or two weeks the psa comes down to a, a very low level in orchectomy and digerlex but it takes a few uh, extra 2 3 weeks for lopalide or uh, any agonist, uh, uh, agonist to act so uh, we have to cover it with the uh, bicalotomy otherwise this is the usual pattern is within 2 uh, or 3 weeks the psa comes to almost at the nadir level in digerlex and orchectomy but it takes around 2 3 weeks extra for uh, 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 agonist you know supposing we have two patients with a similar type of metastatic burden a similar grade uh, of tumor and similar uh, biopsy score and all that you expect the orchectomy to bring the psa level Uh, much more down the uh, LH, RH, agonist or antagonist, or is it the same? Uh, uh, actually, comparative study doesn't show any long-term difference between the speed of decline is go good for orchectomy, but comparative study doesn't show any difference in the in the final PSA level and uh, this one uh, overall survival everything between orchectomy and uh, and uh, uh, look like yeah okay okay uh, one question It's last question to doctor yeah dr haridas i had one question uh, so before you start radiation as was in the first case uh, how long you give the new adjuvant uh, adt uh, so i think uh, there are different schools of thoughts i think generally our practice has been that we give at least 2 to 3 months of new adjuvant hormone therapy so that the second dose or the third dose goes concomitant with the uh, radiation and then we maintain um, uh, continue the adjuvant radiation so uh, based on certain logistics so depends again on the patient symptoms also sometimes like this patient where we have a very significant we might wait a little bit longer to just see if there is a uh, relief in the urinary symptoms so that it doesn't uh, affect his quality of life when we start the radiation so at least a 2 to 3 months for the first dose and then by the second dose we would try to start off with radiation if it's a three monthly injection um uh, jinil do you have any question in the chat box which you want to take or uh, it is uh, we'll call it today i think there is some one question or ten yeah i think we have answered most there are some questions on cord compression and uh, pembrolizumab i think which has been answered in the chat box itself okay fine so if we have answered all the doubts uh, from the delegates uh, it's a time to propose a uh, vote of thanks on behalf of indian school of urology and uh, usi dr keshav was to join but for some reason he couldn't join 
Um, uh, um, uh, my sincere thanks to uh, Dr. Jinil, who has taken his time from his busy schedule uh, for a very important topic, which we wanted to cover because we knew that um, these two agents are going for exam and uh, uh, some case of prostate in any scenario, whether the localized, locally advanced, or, or metastatic is going, they are going to face in the exam. So this was just to have uh, a, a overall case discussion on uh, on the three uh, situations which we commonly encounter and which are kept in the exam. And uh, I like to thank Dr. Janil who um, uh, agreed for convening this session in a very short time and uh, sought the help of uh, Dr. Bindu, uh, pathologist, Dr. Haridas, and Dr. Nikhil, and uh, Vishnu anchoring in for presenting all the cases. Thank you all the faculty on behalf of uh, ISU USA. Uh, thanks all the uh, members who logged in. Thanks all the resident. Again, wishing you all the best if you are close to the examination. And uh, thanks to um, Navneet and Kiran for the logistic app. Over to you. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you.